I'm the moderator, so I'm going to get things started. I'm honored to be here with this group of uh, men who created this great film. I think we're probably all here tonight out of love for this film. And if you're a true aficionado, you're a lover of the film, and you're also a lover of the book, which created the opportunity for this great film. And so I want to start with Nick, because we're lucky here to have the, the writer of the book and, and the creator of the story that laid the foundation for this movie. And I want to start by asking Nick about someone who is conspicuously not here, who's so responsible for this film. And though it's not Martin Scorsese, it's Henry Hill. Uh, Nick, if you could tell us about when Henry Hill first came into your life and whether you could have ever guessed that it would have led to what it led to. Well, um, uh, Henry Hill came into my life because of Ed McDonald. Ed McDonald was in charge of the uh, organized crime strike force in New York at the time. And Henry Hill had flipped. He was cooperating with Ed. Wasn't he cooperating in a way? Okay. <laughs> very cooperative. Um, <laughs> yes. And I start, I'm, well, Henry needed a lawyer, and his lawyer wanted money. And the only way Henry could pay the lawyer was if he got a book deal. So Henry put together a book deal, or his lawyer, Bob Simmels, put together a book deal so that I was hired to write this book about Henry Hill, who boasted more that about it. He was this guy, and he was that big guy. And the more I found out about him, the more I talked to Ed, I realized, no, this is, he's a little guy in this crew. And that's what we need. We need a story by a little guy. And uh, I have to say, with Ed, Ed's help and with that, the strike force and all the um, the FBI agents, they, they did a fantastic job in gathering all the information about these guys. And then I had total access to, to Henry Hill. We traveled. <laughs> we weren't supposed to, but we did. And, uh, and he gave up. He was just very open. The, the, a lot of people ask, how did you know he was telling you the truth? Because he's a professional liar. I mean, he's a total. He's totally well, wait a minute. He was my witness. What do you I know. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I, the, the deal I had was that if, if Henry was caught lying to Ed, they would just throw him out of the witness program. And Henry thrown out of the witness program with Jimmy Burke and everybody looking for him, he wouldn't last a day. So his life literally depended upon telling the truth. And Ed had FBI agents all over the place double checking him, everything he said. Because you didn't, Ed didn't want to go into court with Henry and have one of those defense attorneys, and there was a lot of money to pay great defense attorneys blowing Henry, his main witness, out of the water. Mm. So I was one of the few writers, I think, ever who had the, the, the possibility of knowing that the guy's life depended upon telling the truth. Now, I've heard you mention uh, that Henry Hill, you know, you could get a guy like that, and he wouldn't necessarily be as interesting or full of stories as Henry Hill was. The thing you mentioned that made Henry Hill so valuable to you as a writer was his recall. His memory. Yes, it's it's his memory, and also he was he he had a writer's tongue. He wouldn't write anything. He never even read the book. I said, "What do you mean? You didn't read the book? I just wrote the book." He said, no, I said, "What well, I got to read it for? I gave it to you. I know everything that's in it." So that was his <laughs> that was his attitude. But still, he spoke like a writer. I asked him one of the first questions I asked was. Uh, uh, he used to play the number a lot. And he, the first number he played, he, or when he was playing, he got $600. I said, what'd you do with the money? He says, I bought a 1963 yellow Bonneville convertible. I mean, when you're a writer and your subject remembers something like that from 25 years ago, to that detail, that's what you need, as you know. Yeah, it's incredible. I, it's incredible. Well, you made a decision in the creation of that book that would resonate all throughout the book and the film, and that was you chose to do sections of it in the first person, from Henry, Henry Hill's voice, Yeah. from his wife's voice. What was, your, what was your decision? What was the reason that led well, to that decision? Because their voices were so good. Yeah. I mean, I recorded all that stuff, and on top of that, you recorded, you asked the same question six times. And maybe the fourth time, this part of the answer is better than the, but you know what happens. And so you have all that material, and you have it in their voice. And you can't duplicate, or I can't. There are writers who can do better than that, but I right. can't. And uh, I think that was a very important part of it. So you're getting great stuff from him. Yeah. You're getting You're getting day-to-day -day detail of that kind of life, which is what distinguished right. this book and this movie so much. Were you aware that 
what you were getting was different than anything that had been written about this life before? Well, I knew I was getting it from somebody who was very close and right, a daily operative. I knew guys who were, but I never had, they never were going to tell me their life story as Henry was because that's what he was getting paid to do. Right. Uh, but he was giving you details that weren't just about the criminal life, he was giving you details about the wedding, about the culture that he but That's up. what I was interested in. I, I'm, the crime stuff is boring, anybody can read. I wanted to know about weddings, what did you do? Did, did you go on vacation? No, nobody ever went on vacation. If we went on vacation, we went on vacation alone. Nobody ever took a weekend off. These people were a tiny little artichoke. They lived that tightly connected. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's what I was, I was interested in the sociology and anthropology of it. Right. More than the, the cops and robbers. So I remember quite vividly when the book came out because it was quite a sensation and I think it was serialized in New York Magazine yeah. before it came out around the time that it came yes, out. Yes, the New York was very nice. They, they put it, uh, Ed Kosner was and I very think generous. Irwin, Mr. Irwin Winkler, that's maybe where you come into the picture when, when the uh, excerpt in New York Magazine first appears? Yeah, uh, we were living in uh, Paris. We had, uh, I was producing a picture uh, there, and every Monday I would go to a bookstore, an English language bookstore on the Rue Rivoli, and uh, pick up my Sunday New York Times, New York Magazine, and I read uh, the excerpt in New York Magazine, when it was called Wise Guys, and um, I thought it would make an interesting story. And I called the agent, uh, Nick's agent in New York. I didn't know Nick. Why don't we, we didn't no, know we had at the time. But I knew the agent. Uh, his name was Sterling Lord. Sterling I Lord. He might still be alive. He is. And uh, uh, he said it was available. And um, uh, his co-agent was uh, CAA, and I uh, got them to sell it to me. So how did it get from you to Martin Scorsese? Well, strangely enough, in this whole process of buying it, somebody mentioned that uh, Scorsese was interested. Um, so uh, we had a long relationship going back to uh, New York, New York, and uh, Raging Bull. So I called uh, Marty in Chicago. He was doing The Color of Money with Tom Cruise and Paul Newman. And he said, yeah, I, I really like the story. I'd like, to, I'd like to work on it. And then we made a deal with the Warner Brothers to uh, uh, finance and distribute the picture. And that's where our trouble started, by the way. <laughs> we were okay up until that point. <laughs> right. Because they hated the script, they thought it was too violent, and they thought of, they, the only thing they hated worse than the script was the first preview. <laughs> we literally, when we, we had our first screening and a recruited screening in Encino, California, uh, and we had 34 people walk out in the first scene <laughs> when Joe is putting the knife in, in, in the, back of the guy in the back of the car. And uh, 34 people walked out, and by the time the film was uh, finished, the place was half empty. People were leaving in the droves. And that's our trouble we came with the studio, and they wanted to cut everything and recut the movie, and uh, it was really, really tough at that point. Well, that's, this is a classic, what's now viewed as a classic film we're talking about, the script. Um, Maybe now it's hard for people to watch Goodfellas to recognize what an unconventional film it was at its time, in its day. The storytelling technique, the screenplay. How did you and Marty create the screenplay? How did you do the adaptation from the book into the screenplay? Oh, well, he said, uh, all right, can't, we can't use all the book. What, 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 where do you see the movie? You go off and you do a few pages on what, how you would see a scene breakdown, and I will, and then we'll compare them and we'll see how it works. Now, had you ever done screenwriting no. before? Okay. No, but he's a great teacher, Yeah, I mean, no. So I did an outline of how I would think of it as a movie, and he did one, and they were very, very similar. So then we knew, we leave out all that stuff about the army, there was a lot of stuff we didn't, we couldn't use, but the direct line of this it's kid pretty amazing what, was what, what it was. what you did retain and kept in there, though. I mean, and it's amazing what you retained from the book and kept in the script. Oh, yes. Uh, I guess that's why it was a two hour and 45 right, minute movie. Right. But um, when I say unconventional, what I mean is, you know, Martin Scorsese doesn't really do plots in his movies. He does great stories, but there's not a lot of plot. So Goodfellas unfolds. I mean, I guess you could say the Lufthansa heist is part of the plot line, but that doesn't even come into the movie no, until, late. Yeah. until about halfway through it. So you have this movie that really is just 
about the details of that culture and about that life. Uh, very unconventional. Were, were you concerned about that at all? Was there a feeling that we no, need to have a more, we need to have a plot? We no, don't have a no, all we wanted to do was get across that life. I mean, he had, I had seen Mean Streets. I'd seen everything I'd ever done, of course. And Mean Streets is Goodfellas early. Mean Streets has a plot. But here we had character, and we had, for the first time, a certified wise guy telling what life was like in that world. And we thought that journey was much more interesting and than you, And you were the plot. both agreed on the anthropological Yes, oh, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, that's, I think, one of the reasons that Marty, I don't want to speak for him, but I think one of the reasons why he was interested in the book, there was so much of that. It was really, you know, Margaret Mead could have written that book. I mean, it was that, <laughs> that's, what he, that's what he fashioned on. You know, we didn't need another shooter bump. That, oh, there's plenty of shooting because that's a part of that lifestyle. I'm just, I'm just visualizing Margaret Mead in a social club down on Mulberry <laughs> Street. Um, the so other how thing I mean, did... but I think we should say also is that while the script is the script, and uh, Marty had a vision for the movie even when we were writing it. Uh, he, I mean, he's amazing. He already heard the music, and there were times in the script where he would say, "Put in a window. Put in just type window." So it would type window. And of course, he had that. He was already storyboarding it. And he would put in play, you know, and I would have to type in the name of a, of a musical piece that he wanted, he was thinking might work as a good music cue. I mean, that, that he, all, he sees movies complete. And, and so uh, what, that was was a very work, what was a work day like as you were putting it? Because you're one of the few people on earth that sat in a room and created a screenplay with Martin Scorsese. What was a work day like creating that script? <laughs> it was great fun. <laughs> I mean, I, I once asked Julia Phillips, who was Marty's assistant, and, and I, somebody asked her, you, well, you know, you were right outside. They were in this little place. It was in the Brill Building of all wonderful places. And uh, she said, I don't know. All they did was laugh. <laughs> and that's really true. I mean, it's just, you know, oh, look at that guy. Because we, I mean, we're both clearly Italian-American. We both grew up in a very similar world. I mean, Marty grew up in a world that's like Main Streets. I grew up in Bensonhurst. And then McDonald was very busy just dealing with friends of mine from Bensonhurst. <laughs> so we both knew the world, you know, intimately. And had, it had never really been depicted, and nobody had ever seen the subtlety of it. And so uh, that's what he wanted to do. And he also had a vision for it. I mean, if you look at the movie, he, has, he says, I want to freeze frame. I want to. So he would freeze frame a character, a face, might have been Jimmy Burke. And, and then Henry's voiceover would speak, and then the freeze frame would open up. It was, he had so many imaginative and interesting ways to turn it into a uh, into the, the work he was able to do. Mm. Now, Ed, um, you, you were prosecutor of Jimmy Burke and Henry Hill and many of the characters that were prominent in this story. When did you become aware? Did you read the book, Wise Guy? Is that when you first became aware of it? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, I knew, I, I knew Nick for many years by the time Henry had, uh, had agreed to cooperate. Uh, in fact, you know, the deal that we had was that, I mean, I wasn't supposed to be allowing Nick Pelleggi to be interviewing one of my witnesses. And the deal we had was that uh, Nick told me what he wanted to do. And he didn't want to do, he didn't want to recount the Lufthansa robbery. He didn't want to recount the Boston College point shaving case. He wanted to do a book about the workaday life of a regular gangster. You know, all the other books that came out were about the kingpin, and I was close to the kingpin, and all this other stuff. He wanted to do exactly what he did and, and what the movie became. So uh, I knew he was doing this book, and, and the deal was that he was not going to ask him about these, you know, the major cases that we were investigating. We were concerned that if the defense lawyers found out that he was speaking to a writer, that they could subpoena his notes on his conversations with Henry, and we wanted to prevent him from getting that. So he stayed away from the, mm. the, uh, the things we were You trust You trusted him a lot. I don't, yeah. I don't get that kind of trust from prosecutors. <laughs> well, well, I knew I him pretty well. <laughs> well, so. obviously, uh, what he, what he? Well, I'll just say that we, we uh, uh, in fact, the entire strike force was invited to a, uh, 
screening. Uh, not only a screening, but when the book came out oh. at uh, at Gabe Talese's home, and right. um, there it was like a who's who. I remember my wife said, uh, "Do you think I should get a new dress?" And I said, "No, no, that's okay. You know, you, can, you don't need a new dress. It's not going to be a big thing. It's just going to be a bunch of agents and cops and the guys from the strike force." And we got there, and my wife was standing there taking her coat off, and Walter Cronkite and John Lindsay were standing right in front of us, and I said, "Maybe you should have got the new dress." <laughs> Um, Erwin, you mentioned you were attracted to the project, in, the excerpt uh, in, in New York Magazine. What was it about the material? I mean, there'd been mafia books before, mafia movies before. What was it about this? What I saw in, in Nick's original work, and I think uh, that's the proof of the film itself, every individual section of Nick's book was entertaining. And, and, and that goes for the film as well. You can pull out any five minutes of that film without seeing the five minutes before or the five minutes after, and you'll be entertained. Something is going on. And that's what Nick had accomplished in the book, and that's what attracted me, because you're right, it didn't have a plot. Uh, as a matter of fact, the ending, uh, a guy on a cocaine high with a, <laughs> cooking meatballs with his brother in a wheelchair, I mean, is that an ending for a film? Um, and we, but that went on for 20 minutes, but every moment of those 20 minutes are entertaining. And that's what kept me uh, busy when I was reading it. And I said, this is different. This right. is different. Um, and that was my principal reason. For yeah, it. you hit the nail on the head with that because it, the one thing, and I'm, I'm curious, Nick, whether you had a sense of this when you, were, when you were creating the book. The one thing Goodfellas does is it, conveys a dirty little secret about the criminal life. And that is, for a lot of people who are involved in the criminal life, they have fun while they're doing it. They have a good time. I mean, it usually ends badly. It almost always ends badly. But when they're caught up in it, it's a crazy, party, joyous kind of life. And Goodfellas really captures that. Well, you know what happens is the first probably 45 minutes of the film, you really want to hang out with these guys. They're all having fun, and really the big change happens when Joe Pesci kills Spider. First he shoots him in the shoots leg and him. wounds him, and then the second time he kills him. And then you sit there and say, wait a minute, these guys are not so much fun. I don't know if I want to hang around with them, but by then, you're hooked. Yeah. And I think that was the, the, the first, really, they, they have a great life. And Except for the first 30 seconds when 35 people walked out of the yeah, theater yeah. because somebody's getting yeah, stabbed in the trunk but of But interesting car. enough, Warner Brothers, one of the primary things they wanted us to cut was the shooting of Spider. Huh. The killing of Spider, they said, that's too violent. And this whole picture is about violence. But uh, we, uh, we, we played a waiting game. What happened was we went off, and uh, uh, every time they would call and say, did you try that? They would say, oh, yeah, we tried it. It was really great. And we got a release date on the film, and it was too late to do anything. We just shoved it down their throat. And that's how people <laughs> really. Well, we're all glad you did that. Well, that was that was Irwin. That is what the producer does. Uh -huh. I mean, he's yeah, the director can't do that, and no, certainly the writer can't do it. But that's what Irwin is is really a master at. Well, one thing I want to ask a little bit about is casting. You told me a funny story about um, casting of the lead role. Well, there's no real lead role; it's an ensemble. But the casting of the Henry Hill character in the movie. Could you tell us about that? Well, we couldn't get an okay, a green light from Warner Brothers. They were very, very hesitant because they said, well, you want to start Ray Liotta and you want to start Joe Pesci, and we're not going to give you an okay until you promise us you'll get us a name. Well, we ended up getting Bob De Niro. But I really felt we could do better than Ray Liotta. I didn't think he was the perfect guy for it. And Marty kept saying, that's the guy I want, that's the guy I want. And I kept saying, why don't you look around, see if there's anybody else. And I kept putting him off, putting him off. My wife and I were having dinner one night at a restaurant in, in uh, Venice, California. And uh, Ray Liotta was in the restaurant, sitting with his wife or friend. Uh, and he walked over to the table and he says, could I see you outside? I said, boy, uh, there's going to be a fight here, you know? <laughs> So I stepped out and he said, look, I know you don't want me for the role. And he went into like a 20 minute dialogue of why he would be perfect for the role. And he really convinced me. And I called up Marty the next day and I said, okay, you're right, let's, uh, let's go with him. So that's how we cast him. Uh, and uh, uh, turned out he was perfect for it. Um, De Niro obviously is great in the movie. 
chose to play a small role for him or where he was at in his career. How essential was that to the creation of the project? Well, that was the promise I had given Terry Semmel, the head of Warner Bros. at the time. He said, you have to give me your word that you will get a name for the other part. Uh, and I, of course, said, oh, yeah, you have my word. And I had no idea what we would do. And uh, I was in Chicago at the time making another film, and I called Marty. And Marty said, I have an idea, and he called Bob. And Bob said yes without reading the script or anything. He said, I know about the book. I know these characters. And he wanted to work with Marty, of course. And he said yes, and the pressure was off. Mm. Pressure was off until the studio head came to the restaurant on, I think Nick was on Broadway and like 48th Street or 49th Street, where we were shooting the You Think I'm Funny scene. And they were watching the scene and they were saying, I don't, we don't remember this scene in the, in the script. I said, well, don't worry, we'll take it out, don't worry about it. And it was a scene where Joe Pesci says, you think I'm funny? Uh, one of the great uh, uh, scenes in the movie. And uh, the studio guys were saying, there's something going on here we don't like. You know? and the minute the studio said we don't like, we figured we were OK. <laughs> <laughs> that scene was improvised by Joe. Yeah. Joe so Pesci had true. seen a similar thing happen in a mob social club. And in that scene, other stuff was, he whispered to Marty, let me try something, let me try something. And he tried it, and it was priceless, and of course. Well, so much of the movie feels improvised. Oh, it's a lot of improvised. How much of it was? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, I, I, if you read the book, uh, you know that wonderful entrance, Be My Baby, when you're walking into the Copacabana yeah. with, you know, Ray Liotta and, and Mallory sure. Bracca down the stairway past the restaurant? That's about two sentences in the book. <laughs> But Marty takes those two sentences and just turns it into this extraordinary steady cam. I think it's the longest five and a half or six minute steady cam mm -hmm. shot. And uh, that's it. I mean, you, 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 improvising both from the actor's point of view and the director's point of view is really the key to movie making, I think. Yeah. By the way, that scene took two days to get. The, the first day was just rehearsing, putting the lights in the right place, making sure all the extras were in the right place. It was very complicated. And the second day we started shooting, we really had trouble. And finally we got a great take and it ends up with Henny Youngman saying, take my wife, please. Right. He froze. <laughs> He'd been doing that joke for 100 years and when the camera went on him, he absolutely froze in the perfect take. Which we, had. we finally got it, obviously. <laughs> now, you as the producer of the film, of course he worked with Marty memorably on Raging Bull and New York, New York, New York, New York which is a movie that it, a lot of people think was a disaster that I love. Um, you should have been on the set. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you have your director taking two days to shoot a shot like that, um, do you intrude on that or not, at all? Or, or is that the director's yeah. call? No, uh, basically it was in the schedule, so uh, that wasn't a problem. And Marty was very good about making adjustments. If he needed an extra day to do something, he would sit down and say, okay, how could we work it out so we could save money on something else? And what we did to make up for that extra day on uh, the steady cam shot, when they go to Tampa uh, with the scene where they put the guy in a lion's cage and, and uh, we decided we could save money by not going to Tampa uh, and we shot it in Long Island, got a lot of greenery and it was night, and we put up a sign that said Tampa Bay Zoo, and that was it. So we make up for it another See, now, way. is this spoiling the movie for everybody <laughs> to know that was shot in Long Island? I thought it was Prospect Park. <laughs> no, it was, no, the scene in Wolf of Wall Street that's supposed to be Hyde Park, that was shot in uh, Prospect Park. <laughs> so, Ed, Ed McDonald, you prosecuted Henry Hill. Well, I didn't prosecute Henry. We made a deal with Henry. You prosecuted Jimmy Burke, Jimmy Burke. who became Jimmy Conway in the movie. You you had encountered these characters in real life. When you saw the film, did they resemble the people you knew from real life, or were these just fictional creators? Well, I mean, certainly Henry Hill looked nothing like Ray Liotta. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, uh, and, and De Niro looked nothing like, like, um, like Jimmy Burke. But I thought that, that uh, what De Niro did was that he underplayed the character. I mean, he, that's the way Jimmy would be. He was just a quiet, low-key guy. Uh, and, and I thought that De Niro did a fabulous job of, of sort of capturing what Jimmy Burke was all about. You know, he, did they do any research for you for the role? No, uh, no well, you know, it's funny. That I went out there uh, 
to sort of rehearse the uh, one of the scenes I was in, and I and uh, I had a car pick me up at my my law office. I had been in private practice for about two weeks. I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to be in a movie if I was still in the government. So I was just, I had just gone into private practice, and uh, so I went out. To, I think it was to Maspeth. It was a diner in Maspeth. And so I show up there, I'm a little bit intimidated to see Martin Scorsese and all these people there. And, and uh, I get there and Scorsese and Ray Liotta and Robert De Niro are arguing over who could speak to me first, who could sort of ask me questions and hang out with me. <laughs> because they were all hungry for knowledge about what Jimmy was really like, what Henry was really like. Because they really hadn't met Henry and he was in the yeah. program and I think there was some problem, you know, they, they just never really got together. And Henry would speak endlessly on the phone with Ray Liotta, but they hadn't met at that point. So they were really starving for, for knowledge about what the characters were like. So from that standpoint, they really didn't. They, so they you felt it. like the best looking girl at the prom, I guess. <laughs> Everyone wanted to talk Every, to you. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, was certainly interesting. I, you know, it, it, we had ended up in, in particularly the courtroom scene that I was in. I was almost like a, um, uh, an, a special advisor because people there didn't know what a courtroom would look like or how a courtroom would be set up. And uh, I guess the funny story that we, had, that we have from that is that the, um, uh, I had the judge in the biggest case that Henry testified in was the Boston College point shaving case, and the judge was an African American. And I somehow I mentioned this to Marty the day before, the day before, and I did the uh, scene that was in my office. And he said, "You know, that's great. I'll get an African American. I'm always criticized for not treating minorities well, and we'll get an African American." So, I. I get brought into the courtroom, the courtroom's packed, and I look up and there's a, there's a young African-American actor that must have been about 28 years old sitting on the judge's bench. And I said, Marty, can I see? He said, what? I mean, yeah, and what do, you, what do you think you are? Like, tell me, go on. Just, just, he'd go, oh my God. He said, they got this kid up there. So he said, we gotta get an old guy. You know, we gotta get an old black guy. So he tells the assistant director, who I, to this day I remember his name, was V.B. Borga, who was the, uh, Victor Borga's son. I think it was the assistant director, or maybe the second assistant yeah, second director. Assistant. And, uh, it, and Marty's getting really impatient because the courtroom is packed with, with extras. And you know, all these people were sitting in the audience, and I guess they're all getting paid their SAG rates, and, and the money is just going up, up, up as the hours go on. And, he's, and the guy comes in and he says, We can't find, there's nobody out there in the audience. We have to call, we have to call SAG to try to get someone. He says, Look, I don't, I don't care what you do. I just want some old black guy up there sitting on the bench. So about 25 minutes later, I look, and here's this judge. When you see him, you know, he just looks like a perfect guy for the judge. The story I was told, and I can't swear to the truth of this, was that he was a retired janitor in the courthouse who had come back to visit his friends. And they just grabbed him and they said, you want to be in a movie? And they stick him up there and put the robe on him. And uh, it was terrific. I, so we had to stay late that night. We stayed until about 11 o'clock doing some voiceovers and some scenes over. And, uh, and uh, I always imagined what this guy's conversation with his wife was at 5.30 when he yeah. called him and said, honey, I'm not going to make it home from dinner. I'm with Marty Scorsese. <laughs> I'm Robert De Niro yeah. making a movie. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, we hope that's a true story, even if it's not. <laughs> um, the scene, your big scene where you explain the witness protection program to Henry and Karen is such an incredible scene. I remember the first time I saw the movie and where that scene started, I thought we had jumped out of the movie for a moment because it was so realistic. Had you ever acted before? Uh, how were you able to get such a naturalistic uh, performance in that moment? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I'd never acted before. I just wanted to be myself. And, right. and you know, if I had, uh, I, I guess I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but it wasn't scripted. It was all, you know, just do it over again, do it again. Right. And then Marty would say, okay, Ed, you be angry in the dominant character. The next take, we'd do takes for 20 minutes, and then we did it six times. And then he would say, Lorraine, you go after Ed, you attack Ed. Ask him, Ed, yeah. Ed you'd, be, you'd be sort of timid. And then, Henry, you do this, do that. And we did it like six different ways. And, and that's what they got out of it. And I was just doing what I was told and just trying to be myself. Well, how accurate was it? I mean, did you have a moment like that with Henry Hill where you ushered him into the witness protection program? I did. I had a moment when I was with Henry alone. And then the next day, his wife came down and I met them. Uh, the, there was no uncertainty about what Henry was going to do. I mean, Henry was facing uh, serious narcotics charges from the Nassau County District Attorney's Office. And we essentially stole him from the Nassau County DA's office. And we were somehow, we made a deal, they joined in on the deal. And Henry knew that he was facing lifetime prison sentences 
uh, if he was prosecuted, and the case against him was very strong. In addition, he knew that he would be killed for selling drugs. He violated the Lucchese family ban on, on, uh, on selling narcotics. So he knew he had no choice but to go into the program. So it was more, our meeting was more of me talking to Karen, explaining the program, right. and she had to decide whether she was going to go in. The ama one of the amazing things about this was that Henry shows up with his wife, or he brings them down, the, the FBI agents bring them down uh, the, the next day, and so the wife and the two children show up, mother-in-law and father-in-law, and two sisters-in-law, and two girlfriends. <laughs> and he wanted to bring them all into the program. <laughs> And it was absolutely incredible. So we, the, the two sisters-in-law right away decided, well, you know, we ain't going. We don't think our lives are in danger. And then the mother and father, Karen's mother and father, they, they decided not to go. But the two, the two girlfriends, they were all who were, I mean, they were involved. They had narcotics uh, charges pending against them as well. They were eager to go into the witness protection program, but we couldn't justify a, um, a way to get them in. But one of them, um, a girl, a young woman by the name of Judy Wicks, uh, who was from Pittsburgh, and she ultimately went into what the, they called the Nassau County um, DA's Witness Protection Program, and it was a, what they, the, the, uh, the detectives used to say there was a one-way ticket to some place in the United States, a thousand dollars and a false mustache. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's an amazing scene. You should be very proud of that scene. It really jumps out of the movie in its naturalism. Um, Nick, were you on the set much during the shooting of the film? A little bit, but not much. I, it's very boring for the writer. Right. Uh, because, you know, it's, they're always moving lights and they're doing things 20 times. And by then, you know, you finish the book, you finish the movie. They're now in the production of it. Uh, you're on another subject. It's out of your hands. You know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Las Vegas hanging around in casinos. I mean, you know, you're in another life, and that whole life is back there. Right. So you don't, I, I'm not a person who, who goes to the set very right. much. Right. Now, the film gets made, it comes out, you mentioned a little bit about its reception, uh, bumpy reception. I actually saw Goodfellas. I was writing a profile of Martin Scorsese at the time, and I saw an early version of the film, and I remember seeing it in a room of about five people, and Marty was in the room, and I was, of course, blown away by it. It seemed so raw and unusual to me as a film. Um, were you, the reception that it got, you talked about, were you guys worried? Were there, were there was ever consideration came to recutting the film or altering the film? No, we, we, had, we had faced the studio who constantly wanted recutting, and, but we knew we had something special. We didn't know it would be commercial or not, but that didn't really come into play. Um, we liked the film, thought it was different, thought it was interesting, and our main goal throughout that whole post-production period was to keep that version of the film that we had 32 walkouts in the first five minutes in the, way, in the film the way it was uh, edited. And uh, as I said, we played a waiting game, and we finally got it that way, but we had no idea, and you never do really know whether a picture is going to work or not, uh, but it worked for us and that was enough. Mm. And it was a picture that represented what Nick and Marty and I and the principal actors really had in mind when we started out. Nick, do you remember when you first saw it? Uh, a cut of it before oh, yeah. its release? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, was, uh, I was really happy. <laughs> um, it was just, that, you know, it was, I just really was so happy that it worked out as well as it did and that everything that Marty and I and all of us wanted to have happen actually happened. It was there. There are things in that movie, uh, in the performances, that are not necessarily in the script. Things like, for, for instance, when the De Niro character, there's a moment in the movie when the De Niro character is realizing he's going to whack somebody. And he's in a bar and he's having a drink. And I think it's Henry Hill's voiceover and the dolly's in on Jimmy well. Conway. Making the, and De Niro gets a little gleam in his eye, right. and you it's know one of the great moments. You know that he's made a very evil decision there. There are so many moments like that in that film uh, that are above and beyond the. Script. That's the director. You're yeah. talking about a director there. I mean, yeah. I'd written the scene, yes, but to lay back with that camera and go from Maury, who was the guy busting De Niro's chops about the money, and then have Henry's voice talking about, you know, Maury had no idea how close he was, and Maury is singing Danny Boy, <laughs> so closer, and, Hen and Marty 
takes that shot and gets closer and closer, and De Niro just looks, and of course, Marty, at that point, in the script, I think I wrote Cream. That's the song, it's from, it's a very famous yeah. Layla. rock song. Layla. 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 That's what that, that was in Marty's mind when we were writing it, that he wanted to have that, and that's really a tribute to that song in a way. And to Jimmy, and to it's and just, to Bob's character acting. I mean, that's which the, is really, music. Really music good. becomes uh, another character in Marty's movies. There's no question about it. Um, you got, I think the same thing is true. The scene towards the end, when um, uh, Lorraine is walking, go ask, tell, tells him. Uh, oh yeah. After after uh, after G Henry is arrested, and she comes to see Bob, uh, 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 and and she walks down the street. And he says, go in there and get yeah, a yeah. dress. And go in, right, and it's right there. Right. It's such a casual scene, right. and you know there's evil behind that door. Right. Yeah. It was filmed right down the street from where I live in Boston. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Now, the whole movie quality of it, I mean, the whole thing feels like a home movie, the way it's shot, the way it's acted, the whole feel of it. Was that in the direction, or was that something you tried to create in the script? Well, they're really down-home people. I mean, they're, these are, you know, these are working, this is, a working class kind of movie. That's what gangsters are. I mean, that's there. So, but uh, some of that is in the casting too. Pardon me. Oh yeah, casting the real yeah. people. Yeah, Fab fabulous. <laughs> Marty's just casting was great. Uh, so it was a it was a down home movie. It was not it, nothing lofty about it in any way. If that's right. what you're getting at. Right. So the movie comes out. I don't think it was a smash hit when it opened, was it? I mean, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> what was the initial commercial response to that film? It was Ooh. never never great. Never great. The picture grew over the years yeah. and became a very big success on television, on DVD, and home video, and stuff like that. But it never did big box office business. And then we, we got a lot of nominations uh, for the Academy Awards, and the only one that won was Joe's, Joe Pesci. And we didn't win Best Picture or right. anything like that. Yeah. yeah, but it's an answer to a trivia question, and that was the, what was the, the greatest jip? Oh, in the uh, not that one. Dances wolves. No, no. Wolves. Uh, the greatest jip was Raging Bull that lost to ordinary people. But that was a okay. greater jip. <laughs> well, well, I can name a few. I wasn't in that one. <laughs> you produced so many great films, um, and many of them have won Academy Awards, and many of them have been uh, unjustly ignored, and many of them probably weren't that great. And you know, you've made all kinds of films over the years. Is there a way to know uh, when a film is connecting with an audience or not? Or not? I think the picture that I thought was going to be the biggest success I was ever involved with was the right stuff. And uh, the day it opened in Los Angeles, we we were on the cover of Newsweek when it really mattered. Uh, we had 10 pages in Time Magazine when it mattered, and uh, we thought we'd have a giant, giant success. It was about America when, and very, very patriotic at the end and a great score. Uh, so the opening day, I got up. I didn't read the newspapers or anything because I knew the reviews would be great, and I went to the Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard to see the crowds outside. And uh, when I got there, there was nobody in front of the theater. So I knew right away we were in trouble, but I said, well, the crowds must have been so big, the theater manager let the people in early because he wanted <laughs> nobody there. I went in the theater, nobody there. So I said, well, you know, it's all, it must have been the wrong time. So I picked up the Los Angeles time. Of course, it was the right time. Yeah. Then I went to Century City where it was playing, nobody there. And that afternoon, uh, I'm really, really depressed and my son came to me and uh, he was in the El Rodeo School, which was right near Century City in Beverly Hills. And he said, you know, Dad, my uh, history teacher had arranged for all the kids in the class to go see the right stuff. Instead of sitting in class, they could do their history lesson in the theater. And not one kid showed up. They all preferred to sit in class than go see my movie. <laughs> then I knew we were in trouble. So you really never know. You, you never really know. never know. It's a terrific movie. Well, we have a couple questions, or a few questions here from the audience, and um, I'm going to start. <laughs> I'm going to start with a question that seems like an offbeat question, but I think it's a great question, and that is, who cooked the Italian food in the movie? Rayos. Can anyone answer that? <laughs> it came so, from Rayos. No, the prop man. <laughs> no, prop the, whoever the yeah, commissary we, guy was, hey, and they, it believed. Wasn't he, Scorsese's he, mother? No. She, I'm she sure was, she passed on whether or not it was good enough. 
because she was there every day. Well, food obviously was a big part of the movie. There's yes, a it is. Incredible yeah. food references in it, particularly yeah. the way the mafiosi ate when they were locked up in, in jail, and, yes. the, and the details of the cutting of the uh, of the garlic. Yes. Uh, was that in the script? Was particularly the cutting of the the, the, the garlic? Little, the little speech about how to cut the garlic. Yeah, the, we cut it with a razor. Cut, cut it real thin. thin, thin with it's got to melt. It's got to. Yeah, melt. where did the, was that in the? I think so. I can't remember what's in the script. Well, we're going to ask you a lot of these <laughs> kind of questions. Uh, here's a question: Could the Sopranos have happened without Goodfellas? And I guess that's really a question about the genre of the mafia movie and. Yeah, I mean, could Goodfellas have happened without The Godfather? I mean, it's just there's a, a, had a could any of it happen without Little Caesar? They all come out of a out of a out of a culture, really. Yeah, right? and out of that, it's a genre. It's well, a, I would say this about Goodfellas, and you might have some comments about this. I always thought one of the successes of that series was. They took it out of the urban environment and moved it to yes. the suburbs. That hadn't been done. Right. Really, nobody wanted to see another mafia movie in Little Italy. No. But the idea of the next generation that they had Absolutely. suburbanized. Absolutely. You're right. And, and the, the Goodfellas thing, I mean, The Godfather, this incredible opera. I mean, it's just, an, it's beautiful, and it's, but it's fiction. And Goodfellas is really the working guys. You know, nobody gets close to a Godfather in. And, no, it's fact. and it's fact, and it's fact as opposed to fiction. But Sopranos yeah. did lose, lose, use a lot of our acting. Then the Sopranos comes off it. Oh, they did. Oh yeah, oh yeah. They did. Of course they did. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, Goodfellas. Not James Gandolfini, but a lot of the cast. Yeah. Goodfellas created a whole acting school of actors who played parts in that, who went on to careers playing uh, mob characters, yeah. many in Sopranos. Here's a more of a philosophical question. Not everybody had such great success in their future acting career. No, it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, you peaked. You peaked early. Yeah. Um, here's a philosophical question about the idea of writing about this life and doing entertainment movies about these kind of characters. How do you feel about the potential glamorization effect of writing about career criminals? I, I, just, I, I don't think you're glamorizing them uh, at all. I think you're depicting a lifestyle, uh, and uh, the glamour is in the, <laughs> in the eye of the reader. I mean, they're glamorizing them, but the, the story doesn't. I mean, look at those stories. The ending of those stories is not much glamour in any of those lives. Uh, so I don't know where the glamour is. I think the glamour might, they might have a feeling that I, they're, on, they're in a movie, and I'm not. Right. And I'm honest, and I'm a dentist, and I take care of people. Well, you're not a movie, you know, that's Nobody your problem. Wants to see that. But you may be glamorous, but they're, right. they're, they're, so that's where I think that comes from. Right. See, you know, I always felt, and, and, and I thought that you and Marty, when you made the movie, it's, it, I think that Goodfellas is really a message movie. Um, and and if, if, it's a, if it is indeed a message movie, it was directed at kids who were yeah. growing up in New York and in other cities at that time who might be thinking about getting into yeah. this kind of life. And the first hour or 44, maybe 45 minutes of the movie is about that, you know, the enchantment, what's going to draw kids into this. And it's just complete excitement. And after that, after the, you know, the murder, it, it just descends into hell, and it finishes up with yeah. you know, the, the Henry you know, dr drugged out and Jimmy killing everybody all over the place for no good reason, and just total and complete insanity. They were deranged people. And I think the message is that uh, you know, if you go into this life, it's not going to end well for you. You're going to have a miserable life. And you mentioned, you talked before about you know, the, how much fun that it is, you know, mafia guys have or gangsters have. I think that's yes, sometimes yes, and sometimes no. You know, Nick, we had, you know, we've talked a lot over the years, and one of the things I remembered from what he said, he had this theory that gangsters, mafia guys, love to go to jail because when they're on the street, they always have pressure. They have to perform. They have to commit crimes. They have to put their lives at risk. They have to earn a lot of money in order to get respect, and respect is so important to them. But when they go to prison, they get a breather. And they have some, you know, some guy who was some guard at the prison who's telling them to get up in the morning and to go do this and to clean the toilet and to do this, and there's no pressure on them. And I think that their lives, sure, it's, they have a lot of fun, and they have, or as, as, um, as Henry says in the movie, your line, you have a movie star, they were, they were uh, uh, gangsters as movie stars, or a line like that, or movie stars with muscle. And uh, uh, the, um, 
but when you get into the, you know, the, the, the life is just very difficult with the pressure that they have on them. So I think that it's, it's a mixed life that they have. Yeah, when I say have fun, uh, you know, some of the fun they have is in reaction to the stress. For instance, the scenes in the movie where they're playing cards, one thing you've noticed, if, if as journalists we've interviewed wise guys, when they laugh, they laugh like demented over the, when they live life in that moment, they live it like right. crazy because they know that tomorrow's another day and they could get whacked. Right. They all live with the knowledge of that right. possibility. And so when I say having fun, there is a sort of desperate side to it because they know of the potential consequences. Um, Nick, you have a profound interest in the mafia. Why is that? Well, I think they're really an interesting thing to follow, and um, and uh, I grew up, as I said, in Bensonhurst, and I, as a kid, I was able to watch that world very closely. And why are you not? And a, I was fascinated. Why are you not a made man? Pardon me? Why are you not a made man? <laughs> well, that's why I write about them <laughs> to figure out why. <laughs> um, did you? Did any? Did anyone hear from the the wise guys after the movie came out? I assume this means people who were portrayed in the movie, certainly Henry Hill. Well, Henry Hill came around up, up until about a year or two before he died, right. uh, trying to get another version of uh, yeah. Goodfellas on the board. He definitely rode on the coattails oh, of, oh, yeah. of the movie. <laughs> he was trying to sell the Henry Hill. Published a cookbook, yeah. some other yeah. things. Oh, no, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, well, he was a hustler. He was exactly what he was, and that's why they had him around, because he was an earner. He was out there. He could come up with schemes. He made money for them, and they loved him for that. Everybody loved Henry. It's, it's well, the wise guys, they loved him. The, but in the, in the, the wise guys loved him, but when he came into the program, he, he, was, he would show up, he'd be hung over, I mean, he couldn't pay attention. I mean, he was just, he was hopeless to try to prepare and, and, and to try to get cooperative, cooperative information from him. But the FBI agents loved him, the cops loved him, the guys, the marshals from the witness protection lo program loved him, the prosecutors had him, loved him. Sometimes he would drive you completely nuts, but there was some charm that he had. Yeah. And uh, he just couldn't help but being fond of him. Maybe that was uh, the secret of his success in the underworld. Part of the reason he never got whacked, he was an entertaining guy to have around. Right. I think that I think that was part of it. And a, a part of it. I mean, this didn't get in the book, in the movie. It's the kind of things you, you didn't have time for. But he was a his best friend growing up was Paul Vario's son. Uh, that's Paul Cicero. That's the the Servino character. Right. And uh, the kid was doing an arson for his father, and burned to death. And Henry was his best friend and would go to Paul's house and would go to the hospital for months while the kid was dying. And the father saw Henry with his son. And when the son died, Henry became Paul Vario's son. That's really that connection. That's why it was so strong. And that's why this is the kid Henry and where he's with me. And everybody fell in line. Of the we didn't have time. Or when that, give us the but space. You got so many of those <laughs> you got so many of those moments in the movie, the the, the cultural uh, yeah. environment like, well, get that away these with characters lived in. But there's this, it's so rich, you know. The, the way they took care of each other, looked out yeah. for each other. Uh, Mr. McDonald, did you ever actually say, Don't play the babe in the woods routine with oh, me, Karen? <laughs> I used to say it to every witness. <laughs> <laughs> I said it over and over again. You know, I don't know how I said that. It must, I'm, I'm sure I only said it in one of the six takes. And I guess it just popped into it's my head. It's now the line you're known for. Well, I am now. If I was one of, <laughs> if I was one of your kids, I would repeat it to you every day. Well, they got sick Just to annoy that. you. They got sick of doing that. Um, Nick, um, you know, all of uh, both, well, Erwin had a long career before Goodfellas, but for the two of you, you this is like out of the block. Your first film you're involved in is a classic movie. You've gone on to do a lot of other great work, Casino and other things, worked on screenplays. Is there a, the question is, is there a secret to a, a good screenplay or a great screenplay? What have you learned about screenplay? I'll tell you, you want to know this is my secret? Mm -hmm. It's a great director. <laughs> right. I mean, that movie, that first, Marty helps with the screenplay. I mean, so you write off, you get an extraordinary thing that has his talent in it. Uh, if I had finished that book, whatever the book was, and it was successful and good, uh, and had gone to another director, we would have had another movie entirely. He wouldn't have had the kind of 
the fluidity of this thing. He, 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 it wouldn't have had, I don't think, it would have been the same movie. And I would have been the same writer. Wouldn't have had all that great music in it. No, that's that exactly what we're talking about. That music is sensational. That yeah. music is, as he, Marty says, it's another character. We've got to think about that music seriously. And right. he does. Um, Irwin, what does it take to be a great producer? And, and let, me, let me come at that question by start by saying, um, what, what is your contribution to the film Goodfellas that you take, take the most pride in? Marty kissed my wife at Bell. She's sitting right there. That's my big contribution. Uh, sitting right here in the first row. Uh, but no, uh, what you do as a producer is hopefully you find an interesting piece of material and you go from maybe that little uh, a walk down Paris Street and walking into a bookstore and finding a, a story. Now, as Nick said, maybe another director would have made would have made a good film. Wouldn't have been this film, but it might have been a very good film because it was a good piece of material to start with. But as a producer, you try to basically uh, steer something in, in a version that you're uh, happy with. So you try to bring together all those elements uh, and uh, see it through all the difficulties in making a film because the easiest thing to do is for somebody to say no. Because the minute they say yes, there's trouble because you're going on an adventure where somebody's going to spend, well, nowadays, in, in 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars uh, based on something written, written on a piece of paper. So you have to trust a lot of people to get to that. Uh, and it could be a, many different ways. So um, the success of Goodfellas is basically in the current uh, a feeling towards Goodfella. It certainly wasn't in the initial uh, treatment of the film. Uh, and I think the success also became uh, widespread because there are certain films that the audience has to be told this is special. You can't take it to a recruited or a preview screening cold and start off with somebody stabbing somebody with a knife that big in the back of a car. Audiences don't know what to expect. But after a while, uh, the word gets out, there's a, a press about it, and people are willing to accept more about it than they would ordinarily. Mm. So you have to go through that maze of uh, difficulty. Right, well you're talking about the legacy of the film. Uh, the legacy of the film is tremendous. Um, it's had a long life, people still watch it. I mean, yeah, that's why I'm we're sure, here, yeah. I'm sure anyone in this room goes home, gets home, from a night of boozing or not boozing, and you get home at one o'clock and you turn on the TV and Goodfellas is on on some channel, and you sit down and you can't take your eyes off. Yeah. It. Um, I want to ask the other. By the way, I feel the same way about The Godfather. I think Nick feels. Oh, absolutely. Too. Yes. Same thing. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to ask the the other two panels. You mentioned what the legacy has meant to you, Ed. What is the legacy of Goodfellas meant to you personally? Well, I, you know, I've had, I've had stories to tell for the last 26, 27 years. Um, uh, it's amazing how, how often I get recognized. I mean, I don't look the way well, I Well, you haven't aged much. Yeah, I haven't aged much, yeah. Um, and, you know, listen, it, it was a lot of fun, an incredible time doing it. And I've had a lot of fun telling the stories about it as the years have gone on. And I'm really proud of the right. small contribution that I made. And it's, uh, it's been a kick. Right. And Nick, as the as the creator, uh, the well, I mean, it just it um, it changed my life. I have to say, it, it, uh, um, you know, to get a movie like that made, you, you know, just I'm a writer, I'm a you know journalist, and it's just sort of a miracle. <laughs> that, you know, it was that it was a book that Simon and Schuster was happy to do, and I was happy to do, and, uh, and then for it to get picked up as a movie and by Marty, before Marty was Marty, I mean, he was always talented, but well, it was... This is, this is part of what made Marty Marty. Yes, and well, um, and the things that followed. Uh, and to, to get all that to work is just, a, it's, I'm the luckiest person you could imagine. Well, we'll end it there. I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the audience.